From today's perspective, military alliances appear to have played in the sandbox for decades. But what were once training maneuvers now seem to have become serious. Multilingual general is a profession with a future. Welcome to the panel. Role of regional military and economic alliances. So I would like, without further delay, to um, give the floor to Mr. Ischinger, who is the award winner of the NGIC 2024. Mr. Ischinger was until recently in charge of the Munich Security Conference and when talking about the role of regional military and economic organizations and alliances, I think no other is better placed than to kind of set the scene to tell us how he sees things in general and specifically at this very important juncture in time. Please, Ambassador Ischinger, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and privilege to be here. We don't have a lot of time, and I've, and I, I've been asked to just th throw out a few points and highlights to frame this rather far-reaching question of military and economic alliances or ins uh, regional institutions, as you could also call them. First point I want to make is, for those who are not familiar with the UN Charter, uh, the UN Charter uh, foresees the role of regional institutions and alliances. So it's embedded uh, in this uh, system of global governance which was supposed to be the role of the United Nations family. But that brings me to my first point. Why are regional alliances and institutions today more important than they seemed to be maybe a decade or two or three ago? Because the uh, UN system at large is not functioning as well, as I use diplomatic language, as it should. Uh, when was the last time the United Nations Security Council was actually capable of ending uh, a military conflict anywhere? It's been quite a while. In other words, the, um, the deficits in terms of global governance make it even more urgent and important for regional institutions and alliances to play the role of creating or maintaining stability promoting peace and trying to prevent or resolve or end conflicts if and when they uh, arise. Um, I want to just recall uh, what uh, President Mike Freiberger uh, mentioned last night. Uh, approximately a decade ago, we were both involved in a in a reflection effort organized by the OSCE in Euro Atlantic. Uh, institution. And what we discovered then, and what has become so extremely urgent in the current circumstances, at least as far as the European theater is concerned, is trying to avoid the presence or the creation of gray areas. A decade ago, we spoke of countries in between. There were countries well protected by NATO, there were countries under some kind of protective umbrella by the former Soviet Union, by Russia, and there was a bunch of countries hanging in there. Uh, and that situation has, of course, not ended as we speak. In other words, uh, one of the questions I would be very interested in, in here, one of the answers I'd like to hear from the panelists is, uh, how can we make sure that we uh, prevent the continued existence or the creation of gray areas of countries in between who have no one to look to when they are being threatened by their larger neighbors uh, or, or, or grand powers. Third quick point, what type of uh, institutions or alliances are we talking about? Uh, clearly, the, the title suggests the difference between more economic institutions like, for example, ASEAN, or, as a matter of fact, also the European Union in its original task of creating economic integration for members of the European continent. And then, of course, the more 
military and security uh, uh, or, uh, focused institutions like, of course, for example, NATO. Now, just very briefly, there are fundamental differences between various types of alliances and uh, regional institutions. Let me start by NATO. NATO is the perfect example of an alliance where on paper everybody's equal, but where clearly you have a lead nation. You have a lead nation. That in this particular case is the United States. At the other end of the spectrum, you have, for example, the OSCE, which, is, which has a government based on the idea of consensus. In other words, if one country out of more than 50 happens to disagree, no decision can be taken. You can say that's, dem that's democracy, but it has turned to be a huge problem in the current situation uh, with Russia, where the Russian Federation, as just one country, can of course block each and every discu uh, discussion or decision, whether it's on the budget or on personnel or on, or on programs. And in between um, these two extremes are institutions or alliances with more complicated decision-making um, methods. For example, the European Union. Uh, the Treaty of Lisbon is based on the idea of majority voting with rather complicated details, which I don't have time to, uh, uh, to go into, of course. So what I would like to suggest to you and, 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 and present to uh, the um, prominent panelists in this panel here is the question, what is the right way for us? First, to prevent countries from being left alone and we are in a region here which is full of countries who have been left alone and who have suffered as a consequence of that. How can we make sure that the kind of security architecture we are trying to build is comprehensive and inclusive rather than exclusive? And how can we make sure, what's the best way to make such alliances or institutions effective? Is it good to have a lead nation? which at, at the end of the day makes the fundamental decisions? Uh, or are we so enthralled by the idea of democracy that we want uh, the OSCE system based on, on, uh, on consensus um, with huge problems, potential huge problems for effectiveness? So, uh, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Chairman, uh, with these brief highlights, I want to leave it to you and to the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to turn to our co-chair, President uh, Vera Freberga. Um, if I may ask you, uh, Wolfgang Ischinger pointed at the importance for countries not to be left alone, and that we should work on an inclusive and comprehensive security architecture in Europe, and I could imagine also outside of Europe. Um, I think that you have been instrumental uh, being, so to say, in the front line with uh, Russia as a neighbor, uh, instrumental in bringing your country in a position where it would be guaranteed never to be left alone. And I think there are, last 30 years, you, you experienced at least two um, periods of change with the period of hope after the implosion of the Soviet Union. And could I say that now we are living in a period also of concern about uh, what's happening in the Ukraine, but of course what could be next steps. So uh, if you could reflect on that and give your views on, on, the, on the theme, the role of uh, these uh, regional organizations, be it economic, be it uh, military, please. I'd like to start with a question about economics. Uh, first of all, the European Union is a creation of the goodwill of countries that had spent uh, the previous centuries fighting with each other in very bitter wars. France and Germany alone have just lived through three wars when they started with the coal and steel agreement on which the European Union was later based. So clearly that was a step forward, and as Monsieur Trichet yesterday pointed out, 
the, Europe, uh, the European Union has still a way to go to make, take full advantage of this consolidation, but I think we all agree that it's on the right path and it needs to continue. As far as security, Europe has been a disaster uh, in the Second World War and in all the wars before. Uh, it has had, I think, as many wars as anybody ever has had in, in their history. It has a colonial past behind it, and it has uh, the, the inherit inheritance, there, which has been renounced at least, of various ideologies that were very uh, anti-humane and, as it were, <laughs> completely against the current values of the European Union. Uh, in the case uh, of the three Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, we were the poster children of the abandoned nations. Uh, when Hitler and Stalin were partners just before the Second World War and the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was, was sealed between the two, the secret protocol to this act divided up Poland and the Baltic countries between the two powers, the two dictators, the two extremist ideologies of the East and the West. And my country, Latvia, suffered subsequently during the war both the Nazi occupation and the Soviet occupation, which finished in annexation and a calamitous 50 years under communist rule. So naturally, when the Berlin Wall fall, fell, when uh, the Soviet Union was dissolved officially in December 1991 after the August Putsch, these countries that were the so-called captive nations, as the Americans used to call them, they could not wait to get away, as far away from Moscow as they possibly could, even as they were stuck in the geography where they are, such as Latvia is where it is, on the eastern shores of the Baltic Sea, and of course we cannot move to a better neighborhood. We are stuck with the neighbors that we have, and with the goodwill of these neighbors. But it turns out that there was a doctrine that was an inheritance of earlier obsolete notions of spheres of influence in Europe and elsewhere in the world that accepted, even among the democratic nations of the West, that sort of accepted the coexistence with the Soviet order. And uh, I think President uh, uh, George H. Bush, the, the Bush senior, had a speech in Odessa at one point saying, Ukrainians should not seek their independence. We can talk with Gorbachev, he's a nice guy, I think we can talk to him. Uh, and, and you people, you should not be seeking your independence, you, you're rocking the boat. He said that in Odessa, in a famous speech. And it was <laughs> the first country to recognize our declaration of renewed independence was Iceland, whose president, former president we have here. And thank you to Iceland, where you were the very first and the very fast in, in accepting it. And fortunately, of course, uh, the United States ultimately followed. And when NATO enlargement was uh, contemplated uh, in the early 2000s, uh, we had to keep arguing against the renewal of the obsolete idea of spheres of influence with the thought that we should not be even aspiring to being members of NATO because Russia would not like it. And I kept telling people, what is this idea that a small nation like Latvia was put on earth by the creator of us all, with a single purpose, to make Russians happy. And I said to myself, aren't Russians capable of making themselves happy, live their own lives and leave their neighbors alone? Obviously not. We, we see what is happening in Ukraine. So our goal, obviously, and under these circumstances, was, was and still is, to get away from Moscow as much and as far as we could without moving geographically to a better neighborhood and to, of course to look for partners and understanding uh, allies with the concept that there are certain principles and common values in certain regions that are collectively accepted and adopted and that need defending at any cost. Freedom is one of them, independence is another. The human rights and the right to expression the right to uh, civil liberties, all these principles, when one wishes to adhere to them, one has to have alliances that are ready to defend them, even if there's a cost to such a defense. And the idea of smaller countries automatically having to please their bigger neighbors 
should be stricken from our vocabulary and stricken from international relations because it is completely against the statutes of the United Nations and against international law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in order to avoid, uh, we'd say, Europe centrism, I would like to uh, widen the horizon a little bit and first go to the Far East, to Asia, and then to the Middle East. And uh, in terms of uh, Asia, I would like to ask, uh, well, two views. One out of one from China, and then Susan Elliott, National Committee on American Foreign Policy. In that part of the globe, in that part of the world, how does this play out? Economic cooperation, be it the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, be it ASEAN, um, and how does that, let's say, facilitate or promote peaceful interaction between the, the nations there? Maybe I can start with our Chinese colleague, Mr. Wang Wen, Executive Dean of the Chongyang Institute for Financial <laughs> Studies at the Renmin University of China, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's my great honor to come here second time. Uh, I think uh, uh, today we are have uh, so many uh, distinguished petitioners. And also, this panel we're talking about uh, the military uh, allies, uh, the first uh, grants for Chinese people. If you mention about military allies, we will think about uh, NATO. Because <laughs> uh, uh, this afternoon we mentioned about so many times about NATO. I respect any uh, members of NATO uh, country, but the problem is that as a professor, I have to uh, share some uh, Chinese ordinary people's views about NATO. Uh, I think uh, for Chinese, uh, in the past, uh, 30 years ago, we are not care about NATO very much. But two things we start to care about NATO. First is, uh, maybe you, you, you've got it. 25 years ago, in uh, 1999, NATO bombed Chinese embassy in the Yugoslavia. And that year, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, Chinese people, they go to the street and against NATO. That's first. So we never, we will never forget the NATO's uh, criminal in, at the Chinese embassy at Yugoslavia. So I think this is the first point I want to share with you from the Chinese ordinary peoples. Second view is that nowadays more and more Chinese people, they dislike NATO because NATO now, they uh, uh, push the Eastern expansions to the Asia, as Mr. Chair, you said, uh, uh, and identify China as a, a competitor. So I think that NATO, uh, we have to concern and care about the 1.4 billion Chinese ordinary people's concerns. That first point I want to share with my uh, respect for NATO uh, countries, members and friends. Second point I want to share with you is that when we talk about the, the, the allies, the first idea is to unite and act together to deal with a common enemy or common uh, competitors. So do we need an enemy or competitors in the future? So I think the most important things, if we want to look for the common enemy, I think we have a lot. Not a one single country, but for example, the virus, the climate change. We are talking, we are discussed about many times uh, in this forum. But another thing is AI. I think, uh, I think we, we should discuss, uh, discuss about the AI's uh, threat. Because on, on one hand, we admit that AI gives us a lot of a convenient life. But on the other hand is that we have to think about the governance of global AI in the future. And maybe we should, we should discuss how to prohibit the development of more AI weapons. Otherwise, one day, sooner or later, more human beings will die under the AI weapons. 
So that's why I think last year, Chinese government, uh, our president, President Xi Jinping, launched a new initiative we call the Global AI Governance Initiative. So now, if, if, we, if we didn't discuss the potential threat of the AI in the future, uh, I think uh, we, will, uh, we will have uh, more uh, 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 potential of the of a threat. Uh, uh, that's the second point I want to share. Last point, the third point, third point is that now we are still talking about uh, economic allies. I think uh, economic allies in, uh, in China media for uh, Chinese honored people, we are very few talking about the economic allies. We are prefer to talk about the open, multilateral economic cooperation mechanism. So we're not talking about the economic ally, we're talking about the multilateral economic cooperation mechanism. So such as, as uh, I said, that the China's Bell Law Initiative we launched 10 years ago. And now I think Bell Law Initiative, now we are very successful. We welcome any country's cooperation with China uh, in uh, infrastructure, co construction, in uh, trade cooperation, e even uh, including American. So I think in the future, we need more and more uh, uh, inclusive and open uh, economic cooperation mechanism. So for Azerbaijan, as I, I think Azerbaijan is a very important uh, partner of uh, China BRI initiative and we are uh, very like to uh, push the economic um, cooperation, uh, inclusive cooperation, multilateral cooperation uh, with uh, Azerbaijan uh, and as well as the other important country. That's my uh, uh, point, thank you. Thank you very much before asking the opinion of Susan, maybe first a neighboring country, if I'm not mistaken. Ask you, maybe, President, to react on what has been said by Mr. Wang Wen, please. You mean me? Yeah. Well, I, I, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to the hospital, for the hospitality our Azerbaijani friends showed to us. Well, Mongolia is a small country and a neighbor to China. Actually, we have only two neighbors. Uh, Russia and China we are squeezed between very big two neighbors. So we try to build up uh, very, uh, very friendly relations with our two neighbors. At the same time, we have developed a so-called third neighbor concept, which means that we want also the whole world to be our, also our neighbors. And. Uh, and I think uh, uh, going further and developing this concept, I think eventually Mongolia should come to the status of uh, neutrality. I think uh, that will be uh, much more convenient for us to work with all our neighbors and also with the rest of the world. Well, Mongolia is a small country and we, I noticed the same kind of attitude here when I was listening to the uh, speakers here. Uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, emotions quite similar which we used to have in Mongolia. This is a so-called victimhood culture. We always blame others for our mistakes and for our faults. We think that China or Russia or US or Europe or other countries are uh, to be blamed for Mongolia's faults. Unfortunately, we heard a lot of uh, speakers saying the same kind of things, that uh, big countries are not doing enough, international organizations are not doing enough, we are victims, and we are suffering. I think that wrong attitude is not going to help us to solve all the problems. So I think maybe, um, because I'm not representing China or Mongolia or Russia, I'm just representing myself, I'm not even representing Mongolia, I would like uh, to say some kind of uh, uh, strange ideas so, so that it doesn't mean that uh, there should be uh, ideas exp expressed officially by Mongolia. First of all, I think in today's world, the most serious danger we uh, face is the total annihilation of life on the earth whether it is climate change or nuclear weapons. And uh, there are a lot of uh, words uh, said by leaders and also 
by the people who are close to leaders of those countries who say that they are ready to use nuclear weapons. I think this is, uh, maybe I was young in the time of the Soviet Union, but I don't remember that these kind of words, harsh words and the very strong words were used even in the Soviet Union. So I think it is time for us to unite and demand the total prohibition of nuclear weapons. I have raised this issue with some individuals in many countries, but they were saying, US will never allow this, Russia will never allow this, China will never allow this. But why we have to be, to feel still a victim of these big countries? and complain that they will not allow, uh, I mean, accept this idea. And at the same time, they might decide our lives with their weapons. So I think it's time for small countries like Mongolia to raise their voice. Total prohibition of nuclear weapons is the way for us to have a hope that something good eventually will happen here. Secondly, I think that uh, a lot of complaint here also and also in other parts of the world that uh, uh, five countries, actually we live in the world uh, where five countries decide everything. I mean, the UN Security Council members with veto power, they can veto whatever they want and nothing can be done about this. We can gather together, we can discuss a lot of issues, we can uh, put good ideas, but if it goes to the Security Council, any of those five countries can veto it, and then nothing happens. So maybe we have to deepen and develop the resolution of the United States, which uh, is uh, called uh, United for Peace, uh, where it is said that uh, two-thirds of the countries can overrule the veto of any country uh, which has got this right in the Security Council. Maybe we have to develop this idea and uh, make Security Council uh, more responsible, uh, more sort of accountable uh, United Nations body so that we will be able to use this Security Council not for uh, as a, a body where, which hides the ambitions of big powers, but tries to solve the pressing issues. And we are, uh, uh, because I'm representing Mongolia, I don't think that our Chinese friend will accept, we receive it as a, as a position of Mongolia, but I think we are not living, uh, I mean, the multipolar world is, I think, is not the, uh, goal, it shouldn't be the goal for us. We are multipolar world today. Those five countries in the Security Council are the leading countries which are bringing uh, their, their so-called allies or the countries which depend on them to their alliance and, uh, and try to, uh, to uh, use those countries in their uh, activities. And I think we, uh, multipolar world brings injustice, brings inequality, because in multipolar worlds there is, there are only few leaders, only few leaders, China, Russia, United States, Europe, or France or UK, and the rest are just the followers of this multipolar system. I don't think this is a good system, so we have to think about creating a complex world. Thank you. Complex world, which means that everyone is involved, everyone is included, everyone is uh, counted for. And I think European Union is showing, and also NATO is showing a, a good example, although it was criticized here, consensus-based voting mechanism. Yes, it is difficult. Yes, it is. It takes time. Thank you but it should be based on consensus, not on veto power, not on the majority, not on uh, any other uh, voting mechanism, but it should be consensus-based. That is, yes, very complex world, but this world gives chance to everyone to be heard, 
to be a part Thank of you. this global process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Engbayar. On a personal note, I would like to add that traveling to Mongolia, I was never under the impression that Mongolia was a small country, as you quoted at the start. Can I then uh, turn maybe, Susan, I already referred to your experience in the region, and if you could zoom in, uh, amongst other elements, maybe also on the role of ASEAN in the region and the Shanghai Cooperation Council, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think all of you who know me know that I spent most of my diplomatic career focused on transatlantic relations, making the um, relationship between the United States and the countries of Europe strong. I've served with the US military in Germany. I served three times in Western Europe. I served twice in Moscow, so I feel, I also was US ambassador to Tajikistan, so I feel I know this region very well. So you may say, why is she going to talk about ASEAN? I think one of the things that perhaps many in the audience don't know is that ASEAN, in my opinion, is an example of a regional organization. Didn't really start out as an economic, only an economic organization, but more a, um, a collaboration, a confederation, I don't know the exact word to call it, but an organization of countries of Southeast Asia that wanted to come together and look for ways they could cooperate in not only economic, but culturally, scientifically, and et cetera. And they've been around almost 50 years. They, they oh, excuse me, more than 50 years because they were um, uh, formed, I believe, in, in the late 1960s. The United States has been a dialogue partner with ASEAN since the late 1970s. And as a junior diplomat, I attended many ASEAN meetings with the secretaries of state that I work for, including uh, Madeleine Albright, Warren Christopher, Condoleezza Rice. So I've seen how um, that organization works. But currently, I no longer am with the US government, but I run a nonprofit organization based in New York. And most of our focus has been, we focus on US foreign policy interests and you know, looking for ways that we can present or resolve conflicts. But we focus a lot of what we do on informal dialogues with countries in Asia. So I've really learned a lot in the last five years about um, you know, the interactions among countries of Asia. And I would say that ASEAN, in my opinion, is a really good example of how a, a variety of 10 countries, some smaller, some larger, some like Singapore with, with very strong economies, um, have been able to work together uh, to try to find you know, common interests. And I think one of the things that maybe many people don't know, but dating back to 2005, I believe, that they started um, this um, security economic cooperation and they have eight other countries. So now there's a total of 10 um, ASEAN countries in, with eight mostly in the Asia Pacific region who have agreed to work together on trying to uh, promote and uh, economic cooperation. And those countries include China, um, the United States, it's not in the region, but you know, it's signed on to this. Also Australia, uh, let's see if I don't forget everyone, but Australia and um, Japan, Republic of Korea, uh, Russia and uh, India and New Zealand. So why do I say this? Because what has happened in this is really an expansion of um, strong economic cooperation, looking for ways to increase trade, to increase foreign direct in investment. And I think in a way for these countries to really find ways unlike maybe in a unipolar or multipolar world to work with China and the United States in positive ways. So who's the biggest trading partner with ASEAN countries? China. But who's the number two? The United States of America. And the US has it we're ASEAN countries are our fourth, you know, combined our fourth largest trading partner. So I think this is a good example of how working together and a regional organization who maybe were trying to figure out ways to work with the big hegemons like the US and China in a constructive way where it can benefit the countries of the region. And I think more and more, as Wolfgang said at the beginning, you know, why are regional organizations perhaps flourishing? 
And I think it's in times when larger organizations um, who maybe are dominated by um, countries like my own um, have difficulty um, resolving things. So smaller organizations, one that's been around for a long time, ASEAN, have been able to, you know, to look for ways to improve not only their economy, but their cooperation on culture and, and, and regional issues. And the last thing that I would, you know, say about this is um, I really think that, um, you know, organizations like this, and we have this in the private discussions we have. We had a private discussion last summer with representatives, not government, but non-government from China from Japan, the Republic of Korea, and the United States. And the two smaller countries told the two bigger countries, we would like you two to work better together. Because if you would work better together, we would have an easier time. We want to have relationships with both countries, whether in the case of the US and China, I mean, Korea and Japan, security relations, but we also have strong and important trade relations, and China has very strong trade and economic relations with these countries. So I see ASEAN as a country that's a good uh, uh, organization, that's a good example of a way a regional organization that maybe started small has had a big impact, not only on their region, but you know around the world. So I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Um, I coming closer to Europe again, or to the place where we are meeting uh, at CP. Livni, um, maybe one of the longest lasting uh, conflicts in, uh, in history, um, the um, Gaza episode now. I would like to ask you, at the current state of play, do you see any or what kind of role do you see for regional alliances, regional organizations and how do you assess the political space that could be given to these organizations, alliances, initiatives to help to, if possible, solve the issue or at least bring us out of what is happening now, please. Okay, uh, thank you. I will uh, ref <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm sorry, I asked for the water, that's why I... Was... Oh. No, no, but it's fine, I don't need it now, thank you. Okay, so let's uh, start globally and I'll speak, of course, about the region. So basically, when we're speaking about military cooperation, it is based on the understanding of the common threats that we are facing. When we are speaking about uh, economic cooperation, we are speaking about opportunities that we are looking for. Uh, but yet, after the Second World War, there was another common denominator uh, that united the entire free world, and these are common values that were the basis for the creation of not only military, not only NATO, but also, of course, the United Nations Secu Security Council, uh, the possibility or capability of the Security Council to act in accordance to Chapter 7, uh, in robust uh, uh, forces, and in a way, I would, I would say that this was a kind of liberal of the world unite, not in terms of workers, but in terms of, okay, let's work together, let's define what are the opportunities, but also let's act together, also military if needed, against uh, common uh, threats. And now we are facing a situation where, frankly, the uh, uh, Security Council does not function. And uh, NATO and in Europe, they are looking to the United States, waiting to see whether who's going to be the next American president, and quite uh, worried about Trump's uh, statements until now about the future of NATO and the transatlantic uh, alliance. Now, uh, what is happening is that while we are uh, sharing the same set of values on the other side, there are those that are not only not sharing the same set of values, but they are acting uh, brutally uh, against those that share the same set of values. And uh, it is true, this is what happened on, October, on September 11, ISIS, other jihadists, 
uh, groups, and usually it is connected to some jihadist religious ideology that cannot, that it, they are not fighting for their rights, but against uh, or depriving the others to express uh, their own faith in a different uh, manner. So when I'm zooming in to our uh, region, it is clear that Iran represents, as a state, a rock state, I would say, this kind of ideology, uh, using its uh, uh, proxies in the region. And we see now the Houthis that are acting against uh, uh, the chain of supply, Hezbollah in Lebanon, that does not represent any legitimate interest of Lebanon and Hamas within the Palestinian Authority that does not represent a legitimate uh, aspiration of the Palestinians for a state, but the same uh, ideology. Now, until now, it is clear that all the moderates in the region should have been or should be united against the common threat. But it is also not a secret that for many years, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, or the linkage that Arab state uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict prevent them to work together as one regional alliance against this uh, jihadist group or extremist or Iran that is clearly a threat to other pragmatic countries uh, in our region. It is also clear that they are working against us and speaking, I'll speak of course uh, also about Gaza, but it is also part of the assessments were that the timing of uh, the attack of uh, October 7th was due to the understanding that Saudi is going to normalize its relations with, the, with Israel, giving the understanding that Iran is the threat and not Israel anymore. Now, this division between moderates and extremists exists not only between states, but also within states. And this is something that we see, I just mentioned Lebanon, so you have uh, Hezbollah that represents this as an organization, and now also a political party that is being represented in the government, uh, and uh, Hamas within the Palestinian uh, authority, but on the other side you have the pragmatics being represented by the legitimate Palestinian authority and frankly we have also in Israel different groups, some that uh, are more uh, representing more extreme uh, uh, views and others uh, that would like to, to work with the region based on the same uh, the, uh, uh, shared values. Now uh, between or within the, the pragmatics or the moderates and the extremists, it's a zero-sum game. And this is true also to the situation in, on the Palestinian side. And therefore, when Hamas was elected in 2006, in January 2006, uh, the entire international community set what is called the quartet requirements. The quartet includes at the time, well, Maybe it was the last time that the US and Russia worked together with the EU and with the United Nations, saying that they can be Hamas, get legitimacy if they would accept uh, or renounce violence and terrorism, accept the right of Israel to exist. And only two countries were not willing to support this international decision. Uh, one was Russia, and the other was Turkey. So this portrayed also something that was underneath the surface at the time, because I'm speaking about 2006. Now, the reason opportunity now, and I'm not speaking just about working together against uh, the common threat, but also since, not since, the, not only because there's a linkage uh, between the regional relations between Israel and other countries, especially Arab countries, and given the fact that some normalize also already their relations with Israel, uh, there's a need to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I believe that this is an Israeli interest as well. But in order to do so, we need to understand that there are those that are part of the other group 
And when people are calling for two states for two people, something that I do support, so you know that Hamas doesn't support this. They, they represent the same extreme ideology and are not willing to accept the right of others to exist, mainly uh, the state of Israel. Now there is an opportunity on the table, and I want to speak in a more hopeful manner. And the opportunity on the table is based on this understanding. And the meaning is that an understanding, uh, and this is a plan led by the United States, saying, okay, we understand that Hamas is destructive to any alliance against Iran, and also destructive if we want to achieve peace between Israel and the Palestinians, so the goal of eliminating their uh, terrorist capability plus topple them as a regime is legitimate, but yet let's work together, uh, United States and Saudis, hopefully Saudis and Israel, and then Israel should also contribute its share uh, by working with uh, the legitimate uh, PA uh, toward peace based on two states for two peoples. I support it, uh, and other, of course, uh, countries in the region can participate, including Egypt, including uh, the UAE, including others. Uh, I, I, I believe that this can be the opportunity not just to work together against uh, the radical elements in our region, but also to work together toward peace, and it's not a secret that the Israeli Prime Minister didn't accept uh, this idea until, until this moment. I don't know what will happen in the future. But there is one thing that I would like to say while we are focusing on Gaza. I spoke about uh, the United Nations Security Council. While we are looking uh, at Gaza, Hezbollah is targeting on a daily basis, Israel. Now, in 2006, when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, I initiated a Security Council resolution with the entire international community and with the legitimate government in Lebanon. Uh, Security Council Resolution 1701, saying that uh, the goal is to dismantle Hezbollah, international forces, it was not unifil, it was a stronger unifil with European forces came to the region, uh, came to the south part of Lebanon, acted against Hezbollah that, and pushed him uh, from the Israeli border. An arms embargo was uh, uh, not only uh, written in the resolution, but ships came to the Mediterranean in order to stop infiltration of weapons. And why I'm saying it? because I hope that it would not happen, but more people will be killed. They may be Israelis or Lebanese, and this can happen and this might happen only because the international community is doing nothing. Resolution was voted for, but nothing is happening. And when the Secretary General of the United Nations is speaking about rebuilding trust in the Security Council, how can we? And this is happening now. It's not connected to occupation. It's not connected to the conflict. This is just Hezbollah as the proxy of Iran. And it's a great opportunity here to call for the international community, for the United Nations, for member states to implement what they voted for before more people, innocent people, will be killed. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Coming closer again to, um, to Azerbaijan and even uh, uh, beyond Azerbaijan, we come in the Western Balkans and we have with uh, President uh, Grabar Kitarovic, I think the uh, privilege to have someone that has hands-on experience in both an economic organization, well, more than an economic organization, but an organization, the European Union, that started as a P3 
peacemaking project starting from the economy, joining the economies, integrating the economies, and then a even professional, political, but also professional activity within NATO. I have, in fact, two questions. The number one is, I mean, historically, NGIC has always been close to the Western Balkans in its constituency of members and in its themes that have been discussed. I would ask your view, your take on where we are now. I think our co-president rightly mentioned European integration as a peacemaking proce process, project. It seems to have been a little bit stalled in terms of absorbing, so to say, accepting the Western Balkan countries as, as, uh, as member states, uh, not to talk about Croatia, Slovenia, but some other countries queuing, so to say, and that are being caught up now by Ukraine, Moldova. So what is your view on that and the capacity of the Union to respond to this historic window of opportunity? Where are we, to your opinion, where are we now in reality, in political reality? And then the alliance. Um, the most successful defensive alliance of modern history, but an alliance that seems to be under pressure because of maybe some dissensions under some leading nations within the alliance about how the alliance should function in the case of the aggression towards Ukraine. What is your view, second question, on this kind of tensions and the capacity of NATO as a whole to overcome this and to be the safeguard of, uh, of all the member states, uh, including the European member states, uh, in the near future. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the questions. And um, I'm actually going to combine this and, and, and go back to the original questions that uh, Wolfgang posed. And that is how to avoid these uh, gray areas and unprotected uh, countries. And second, how to make alliances functional. Well, first of all, it is no secret that I have personally and Croatia um, supported and advocated for the integration of our neighboring countries in what I prefer to call Southeast Europe rather than the Western Balkans into the European Union and NATO for those who want to. Because we believe that that is the precondition for lasting peace, stability, and security in that part of Europe. And I also resent when people call that area as Europe's backyard or um, Europe's front yard. This is part of Europe, and I wouldn't even call it enlargement, but consolidation of Europe and the European Union uh, in our neighboring countries. And as a matter of fact, all of them happen to want to become members of the European Union. Now, I do believe that their progress on the way should have been recognized a lot earlier on an individual basis, each country progressing uh, in accordance to what they have done in terms of for fulfilling the criteria, which is basically internal reform and creating a better life for all the citizens in their countries. So the process has been stalled and by stalling uh, the process, we were creating dangerous vacuums that were being filled by doubt and that were being filled by the influence of third parties who are not necessarily benevolent to the region and to the security and prosperity uh, of the region. Um, I am extremely glad that Bosnia and Herzegovina has finally made that step on the way to um, um, negotiating on the EU membership. But it actually took aggression against Ukraine and the war in Ukraine to bring some sense to uh, the European Union that we need to consolidate the space and that through reform and through democratization and building stable institutions, we um, build stability for the whole of the European Union. And cohesion policy there is also very important. Uh, now, coming to NATO, obviously NATO is not a choice for all the countries uh, in our neighborhood. But nevertheless, uh, NATO is an alliance that um, is first and foremost a defense alliance. It's a regional alliance, so it encompasses the North Atlantic space that is 
precisely defined in the, uh, in the founding treaty, which, by the way, refers to the UN Charter as well, and, and quotes the um, UN Charter. Uh, and uh, it is in that way NATO's responsibility also to keep peace and stability, not necessarily through membership for those countries who don't want to, but through different kinds of partnerships and security guarantees. And um, speaking about this, I just want to refer to what uh, the Chinese colleague said here. I apologize because the acoustics is not well on this side of, of uh, the aisle, so I may have misunderstood something. But NATO is not China's enemy. NATO is a defensive alliance, and I think you mentioned um, the, the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. Well, unfortunately, it was a mistake, but that was part of what Wolfgang talked about. How do we protect people, countries, and entities who yeah. do not have protection? So it was part of a NATO operation, which was later declared um, legitimate in terms of the intention of protecting civilians from uh, mass atrocity crimes, but not legal because it was not under the Security Council resolution. But nevertheless, uh, the role of NATO remains defensive. Um, and NATO at this point is facing one of the most challenging moments uh, in its history. Uh, the most complex security environment uh, in a generation. And NATO is adapting in that, primarily in its defense and deterrence posture. And everything that is being done to reinforce the eastern flank, Central European countries, is in defense uh, of NATO itself, of NATO's territory, of, uh, uh, of resources, uh, and uh, of people and also reacting to the war in Ukraine, aggression against Ukraine, supporting Ukraine's right to self-defense, to sovereignty, territorial integrity, and what is very important when it comes to alliances, be it NATO or the European Union, the freedom of choice. So there is criteria to be fulfilled. Alliances have the criteria who can become their members, but it is up to those countries to ultimately take that decision whether they want to be part of an alliance or not. So the same goes obviously for Ukraine, where people are unfortunately being bombed every single day, civilian infrastructure destroyed, and so many civilian casualties. The war in its third year that has now reached um, the state of positional warfare that some people call a stalemate, where Russia has made some uh, minor but very important uh, gains. And uh, this situation, I am afraid, will continue in the next several months because Ukraine can defend themselves efficiently and counter Russia's mass in human resources and in weaponry only through the assistance from other countries who provide not just ammunition uh, and artillery, but also the precision that is needed in order to counter that mass um, effectively. So um, this year, 2024, will be crucial because we will see if Ukraine will have enough uh, of those capabilities to be able to defend themselves. There are different scenarios that I would not exclude of Russia taking more gains or even overrunning Ukraine. And then what happens next? And that the perception of NATO as an alliance is that it does present a threat because it represents expansionism. And uh, there is no justification in beginning a war if you believe that you are uh, threatened by an alliance, the way forward definitely is diplomacy, talk, and uh, working together. Now, 2024 is also crucial because we're facing the elections in the United States, and there has been a lot of debate about what the transatlantic relationship will look like uh, in case um, former President Trump wins. In case President Biden wins, we can expect continuity. But uh, President Trump um, has proven to be um, a little bit more unpredictable in his reactions. 
Although I, um, some, as someone who has uh, witnessed some situations around the NAC table, I must say that he does believe in the transatlantic alliance. He does believe in the right of Ukraine uh, to self-defense, for instance. But he also demands that Europe steps up uh, in terms of the commitments that we ourselves have made to invest into defense at least 2% of the GDP. And I'm pleased to see that um, the European side of the alliance has actually be, been taking very specific measures from creating um, funding uh, to different programs which allow for procurement of defense technology and investment into innovation and European defense, uh, defense forces. There's been a lot of talk about strategic autonomy, which I believe is misunderstood. This isn't about decoupling of the European Union from the United States. The transatlantic bond will remain. Uh, NATO will remain essential for the defense of Europe. But uh, it is also true that in Europe, we need to be able to build um, more, to contribute more, the Ukrainian, uh, the war in Ukraine has been the case in point that uh, revealed the vulnerabilities that we have in terms of lack of ammunition, equipment, and industry. But there is political will, in spite of some disagreement. NATO functions on the basis of consensus as well. Once a decision has been taken, you don't have to participate in its implementation. But everybody has been given a fair chance to state their opinion uh, in, uh, in the matter. So looking at the future of the transatlantic relationship, uh, in spite of all the difficulties, I am optimistic, but that will require cohesion and unity within the alliance and projecting strength and determination uh, towards uh, beyond our borders in terms of continuing to defend and first and foremost, deter any potential military or any other hybrid action against uh, our countries and our people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Last but not least, Dalia Griboskaite. I have to read because, very sorry, but your family name sometimes is uh, not evident for me as a Belgian. Apologies for that. But I would like to maybe elaborate on the last part of the, um, of the intervention of um, President Grabarki Tarovic. I think it is, um, well, let, it put, let me put it a little bit bluntly. It's easier to talk about what's happening in Ukraine um, as, a, as a Belgian, as an American, as a Canadian, than it um, could be for um, a politician or a citizen of Baltic nations, of Baltic countries, having Russia as a neighbor and having uh, cities like St. Petersburg within reach of, what is it, 150, 200 kilometers. And then there is Article 5, and there is also some safeguarding language in the, uh, in the treaty, the European Treaty, Treaty of the European Union. But in reality, and with your experience, your vast experience, how do you assess the current situation? Is there any concern in terms of the capacity of uh, both NATO and the European Union to show the solidarity in implementing Article 5 and the provisions of the European treaties, if it ever would be necessary? Okay, we are two from Baltic states and both we are neighboring Russia, uh, directly Latvia and also Lithuania because we have also Kaliningrad and Lithuania is bordering two Russias because we have Belarus on another side, and it is already in the direct influence by Russia. And we call it two Russias on our board. And we see how this country is behaving towards its neighborhood, towards Ukraine. And for us, we took Ukrainian uh, attack and the war in Ukraine directly as attack on Baltic states. This war is against us also. It's not only the war against Ukraine, is the war against us, it's a war, is the war against the European Union, it's a, a war against democracy and our life, style or, or, or dreams of life. But uh, let's leave uh, this and this the fact which nobody uh, argues with. Uh, but 
what we are doing because of that, uh, what NATO is doing because of that. And uh, today, Baltic states are already with Poland together reinvesting in our uh, defense capacities and capabilities between two and a half and three percent already GDP and going up. Poland is already uh, rounding uh, more than three percent, and we will be talking as much as necessary to invest into our defense. That's our obligation, and it is a threat which we're seeing very clearly, and we are not waiting for the elections in the US. It's European obligation to take more burden of responsibility in the defense, military capacity, and security of Europe. And this goes a little bit to the question, why? Regional organizations, even the region in the international organization, is becoming more and more important. And I can say mainly because of failure of world leadership. Today, we do not have anywhere positive leadership which can and would like to take responsibility for global security, protecting smaller neighbors, protecting others. I'm sorry to say that negative leadership is perfectly visible. A negative leadership we have in Russia, in other countries, not blaming and naming, but we know. And that is a fact which makes us very difficult to see that in years, 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 and maybe decades, we are facing regionalization, the fall, free fall of deglobalization still, and it's very bad. That means that multilateral organizations, as we and others, will be even in more difficulty to make decisions and even more paralyzed. What that means, that we will be facing decisions. Or we hanging with such organizations and such decision-making process, or we are going for serious reform or even creation of new entities. But usually we know that we are capable to create new global entities only after a huge, huge disaster. Usually it was the worst. After Second World War, we created security institutions, security uh, in infrastructure. But this security organizations, infrastructure, is now practically collapsed. And mainly because of that, we do see such kind of negative leadership the terrorist behavior, the war criminal behavior against its neighbors. And we are not able to respond appropriately. The lack of world leadership today is so visible and open that we, the Western special leaders, allowing for such negative leadership to perform such atrocities, the wars against the neighborhood. And probably before it comes better, before we will be able to go together and take responsibility for our future, we will still be facing a lot, a lot of difficulties, even decades of difficulties. And why, in my opinion, it's not important even what outcome of elections will be in the US. Already today, even in this country, the leadership is failing to take responsibility what's happening in Europe, was happening in Middle East. Today, we do have problems of the world leadership and security guarantors. Nobody's taking that responsibility anymore. Why regional organization became more important? Why even Europe is trying to fill the gaps of security uh, providing its on its own in the framework of uh, the European agreements, which never been the case before. Uh, Europe was created as economic organization. Today we're talking about some kind of investment in defense, in cyber security, in a lot of things which never thought to be the function of Europe, and mainly because it is a security gaps in Europe, mainly because the international other organizations are failing to provide it. Energy security, cyber security, i.e. intelligence security. That's Europe took the leadership, not NATO. NATO was behind it. NATO thought that it is only military security in the against, but the life change is not only about 
direct military threat, it's about also the cyber threat. You can, with soft power, make a more uh, damage even than with direct military attack. So the world is changing. We are late to be changed on time and appropriately. So the lack of leadership is main the reasons why we are still in this position. So I'm optimist in general, but I only want to wrap up that before we will became better, we still will face a lot of difficulties, a lot of fluctuation, a lot of deglobalization, de demutinalization, and this is a huge problem. Our generation, younger generation, will face in years, decades, not even years, but decades. I will give the opportunity to Wolfgang Ischinger to uh, react to that very strong statement, uh, saying, well, it's the lack of global leadership that gave space to regional organizations, amongst other things. But first, uh, before coming back to you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I would like to answer to Mr. Wang Wen, who raised his hands for a personal fact, or okay. please, uh, briefly the floor. Yeah. Oh, very, very briefly, just as we think things. First, I'm very glad to hear and then you talking about NATO is not China enemy, because I have uh, more than 10 million fans in Chinese uh, new media. I will broadcast your statement in Chinese media. Of course, China don't want to identify NATO as an enemy. So I think people and people exchange are very, very important. Actually, China don't want to make any enemy with any country, any organization. So I think this is true. China wants to construct a new world without enemy. Even in the United States, we don't want to make an enemy with the United States. We have a lot of we, we have a lot of cooperation with the United States. Still now, we every year we have more than a, a, a six hundred billion U.S. dollars bilateral trade with the United States. Also, uh, every year, China has more than. Uh, uh, 300,000 young students uh, go to the United States to, for, uh, for uh, studying, right? Yes. And, and I say the first sentence. Second sentence is, is I said, but now, because of uh, maybe pandemic, because we have to know more uh, people and people exchange like, like today, uh, and also maybe uh, NATO uh, official documents often mention about China, mention about Asia, so make a lot of more and more uh, 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 Chinese people. They will misunderstanding. Maybe uh, NATO identify China as a competitor, something like that. So I think that exchange, uh, uh, avoiding misunderstanding become much more important than before. The second point. Third point is that I think trust China wisdom. Trust China wisdom to deal with or solve those uh, disputes. You know, in the, in, the, in the past 45 years, at least 40 years in the past, in the past China has no any war with any country. Of course, we have a lot of dispute or contradictions, but China keep our patience to solve those uh, disputes and uh, contradictions. Even for the United States, we have a lot of contradictions, but we, have, we keep patience to deal with the United States and, and try our best to to seek for more and more cooperation with with U.S., so I think don't worry about China's uh, uh, rights, because uh, 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 now in the Western media, even in uh, in NATO uh, official documents, you always talk worry about China's rights. So so I think that uh, trust China and engage with China and uh, maybe make friends with China. Uh, and then we can avoid a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we had an excellent round of interventions. I would just like to add for, for the attention of all the people in the room that, of course, we, we could have had representatives also from the Global South and from Africa, Latin America, where I think we have also some trends of regionalization in terms of security and, and in terms of economic cooperation. But it is like it is, is because of the the lack of time, of course, to, to invite all parts of, have all parts of the globe represented here. But I would like to turn the floor now to uh, Ambassador Ischinger to react to what he has heard and maybe to give his views on uh, yeah, what kind of conclusions he would draw from, uh, from what Thank he heard. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Just a couple of points. <clears throat> but the 
remarks by our Chinese colleagues provoked me first to, uh, to express the hope that indeed China will manage peacefully to handle the really quite significant number of territorial, of unsettled territorial disputes with so many of her neighbors. Let's hope uh, that. And I can tell this audience that um, in recent polling data uh, done in Europe, um, of course the biggest fear by our populations is about what's going to happen about Ukraine and Russia. But the second most important concern is, um, is China going to, um, to take military action, which, is not, which it, it has not excluded to do, um, uh, in the direction of Taiwan. So there are concerns which hopefully China will be able to handle. But what I really wanted to, uh, to do is just add a couple of footnotes to our conversation. First, for those who have doubts, and I know there are a number of my friends from Serbia here in, in, in this place, um, I just want to uh, highlight one point which is, as I found out, mostly unknown even to people who have been familiar with NATO over the years and the decades. Just think for one moment what would have happened in the European theater over the last 40 or 50 years with the problem of nuclear non-proliferation. I mean, I can tell you that my own country would not have accepted to remain non-nuclear and without defense when the Berlin Wall went up in the 1960s. And the only reason why my own country accepted to be a non-nuclear country was the promise of NATO that there was going to be a protective shield even if we, did not go, we were not going to have our own nuclear weapon. In other words, the role of NATO of the last number of decades as an instrument and as a promoter of nuclear non-proliferation has often been underestimated and overlooked. First point. Second point, second point just to underline the point made by Colinda a few minutes ago, uh, on the quest for European autonomy. Indeed, we should not uh, interpret this as a, as a quest to disengage from America. But the facts today demonstrate that we have a problem. We have a problem, for example, in terms of the necessary amount of ammunition to be produced in order to help Ukraine defend their own territory at their borders. The United States of America, which has in the past supplied the lion's share of European military equipment, is currently completely unable to respond to the need of ammunition. In, in other words, if we want to do what we're supposed to do, we have to do it ourselves. And this is why the European Commission, just a few days ago, came out with a with a large plan, a rather ambitious plan, to uh, try to make sure that over the coming years, um, um, uh, the European Union should make itself capable of producing at least 50 percent, 50 percent uh, of what is re what military requirements are going to exist in Europe and not be required to buy it overseas. I think that's an eminently sensible uh, proposal. Just think what, what members of the US Congress would say if the Pentagon told them that they're buying the lion's share, 60, 70, 80% of their military equipment in Japan or in Germany or in France. That would also not go down well. Last point, uh, if I may, on uh, on the question of Ukraine and NATO. I think there is also sometimes not enough creative thinking here. Let's assume for a moment that there is going to be an end to the conflict, whether it's a ceasefire or a negotiated peace or whatever. And 
NATO has of course said in official proclamations that we wish to see Ukraine as a member of NATO as soon as possible. Most members say that that will only be possible once the, the fighting has ended. And I would not want to disagree with that. But then there are members who will say, for Russia, this will never ever be acceptable. Well, let me point out the following. In 1997, NATO and Russia agreed what is called the NATO-Russia Founding Act. And in the NATO-Russia Founding Act, Russia accepted the idea of NATO enlargement. And in the NATO-Russia Founding Act, NATO accepted a number of restrictions regarding its own activities in future new NATO member countries, including, for example, an obligation not to deploy, for example, nuclear weapons in new NATO member countries. Here is my point. If Ukraine remains a non-NATO country, Poland, Germany, Norway, anybody would be free to deploy divisions, divisions in Ukraine. There is no law against that. Ukraine would be free to develop nuclear weapons. If Ukraine were, in the future, a NATO country, there would be, if we accept the continued operation of the NATO-Russia Founding Act, there would be limitations which, in my humble opinion, would be extremely beneficial to Russia's security interests. So, rejecting the very idea of NATO membership for Ukraine may actually uh, a short-sighted approach. I think it's good to think about that once again. Thank you very much, Eve. Thank you. Before giving the floor for a couple of questions to the, to the audience, a remark by the President of Mongolia. Yes. And then well, a couple of questions from the audience. Yes, I, I think, uh, well, thank you for giving it, me this floor. I was uh, sitting in, uh, on the side of this beautiful panel and I was watching and uh, I do understand the concerns of European countries about the current situation connected with the war in Ukraine. But unfortunately, I do see how war is in our mind. War starts and goes on, first of all, in our minds. So I see that whole world, especially these panelists, very much have this war in their minds. But at the same time, I understand why do they keep this uh, war in their mind. But I think better if we try to get rid of this narrative of war. Because human beings do follow narratives, do follow the words, do follow their thoughts. So from Asian, Asian Mongolian, not Chinese, but Asian Mongolian, a small country, we think small countries, when they let big countries talk too much and follow their narratives, follow what they are talking about, and siding with one of them is uh, not a good way to solve the problem. We become a part of the problem. We deepen this problem. We make this problem even more uh, unsolvable. At the same time, I would like to say that uh, this war and this uh, conflict is because of this ancient uh, concept. Man is the measure of all things. So we decided to create a huge superman, a man who is uh, the conqueror of the world, the man who decides on behalf of him or herself everything on this world. I think it's time for us to think that life is the measure of all things. Life, not man. So okay. when we start talking about life, we have to stop talking about uh, man. And then a uh, very uh, stupid two remarks. Uh, I think uh, I'm a follower of uh, John Lennon and I share his dream of no armies in the world, no NATO in the world, 
no military uh, coalitions in the world. And because of these armies, only big countries win. Small countries with their armies cannot do anything. So armies are for the benefit of big countries, for the benefit of uh, big countries to play their strange narratives which they have in their minds. Okay, that's Thank quite you. provoking. Uh... I do wish to beg, uh, to object to the statement by the president, former president of Mongolia. Between the First World War, after which Latvia declared its independence, along with its neighbors, and the Second World War, Latvia was a neutral country, member of the League of Nations, and had declared its neutrality and desire to stay aside from any kind of conflicts between the big countries. Uh, this is a sort of posture that was the basis for us being occupied for five long decades by totalitarian, totalitarian powers from our neighborhood, especially the Soviet Union. Being neutral is not a guarantee of not being attacked. We know whereof we speak. And Finland knows whereof we speak, and Sweden as well, because they have joined NATO because Ukraine was attacked, and they, as close neighbors, realized they could be next, just like we. One cannot lay down one's arms, like Pope Francis is saying, that the Ukrainians should raise the white flag and surrender. Pope Francis should read the latest declaration by ex-president of the Russian Federation, Medvedev, made just recently, within the last 24 hours, where he outlines that the Ukraine, in quotes, in other words, it's not really a country, it does not exist, it is going to be destroyed, it is going to be conquered, it's going to be accepted and integrated into Russia. Anything Ukrainian is considered as Nazi and Nazifying, and they wish, just like the Hamas wishes to destroy Israel, Israel wishes to destroy Hamas, well, Russia wants to destroy Ukraine and it will destroy anybody else whom it decides to do so. Having no defense is a guarantee of falling prey to predators, to madmen, and to ideologues of grandeur who want to imitate their historical predecessors and turn back the wheel of history. We have time for one question on behalf of the younger generation, as was agreed at the start of this uh, part of the meeting. Is there a microphone, please? No? Repeating your question. Yes, to be heard. Uh, yeah. my question is actually based on the fact that unlike schools, hospitals, pensions, defense investments don't win you elections. And since this year we are celebrating not only 75 years of NATO, but also 10 years of the pledge through which the NATO allies committed to 2% of their GDP to defense and only 18 countries currently will spend actually this year are expected to spend 2% of their GDP. And we have seen that my generation actually has this hesitancy of joining the military. How can we sell the proposition to qualitative defense investments to the people that go and will have in this biggest electoral year need to choose wisely for transatlantic security that is strong and that makes us united. Not because defense investment makes us united more than strategies and more than new uh, committees and all of those abstract things. Thank you. Who wants to react? Yeah, please, Daria. I was the president uh, two times. Putin helped me to win the presidency. First time, because of the threat of economic blockade, economic sanctions against Lithuania. Second time, because of Crimea occupation. It was possible to rally, politically to rally people behind 
the idea of security of your country. So it's ironic, but I'm saying Putin will help us all in Europe to understand what is important the first. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. I would like to ask your applause for this uh, outstanding panel and for the... And good just to mention Thank the fact much. that it's nice that we have five women on the stage talking about security, not only men. Thank you.